This is Speaking of Pets podcast, where we give you up-to-date, accurate, science-based information when making decisions about your pet's health. From experts in dermatology like my sister, surgery, internal medicine, CBD use in pets, the pet food industry, you name it. If it affects pets, we'll talk about it. Today's Speaking of Pets podcast is sponsored by Blue Buffalo, the maker of natural pet foods. Love them like family, feed them like family. Blue Buffalo offers wholesome, meat-first recipes with high-quality natural ingredients in flavors dogs and cats love. Discover formulas for all breed sizes, life stages, and lifestyles. And with Blue Buffalo's True Blue Promise, that assures that real meat is the first ingredient with no poultry byproducts, no corn, wheat, or soy, and no artificial flavors or preservatives. I have to tell you, I know that March is toxin month, okay, for pet pets. Poison, so pet, 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 pet poison prevention month. That, yes. too. So I come home yesterday, and little Annie, the little ex-mill mama, mm-hmm. I go in the bedroom, and she got into my purse, and guess what? There's gum in there. <laughs> So like the good veterinarian I am, I went to Dr. Google right away. My best resource. (laughs) Yes. And here's just a tip for everyone. Dentine ice does not have xylitol. Xylitol, of course, is toxic to dogs, but dentine ice has sorbitol. So we were okie dokie with that. But, But there are artificial sweeteners sometimes in peanut butter, which we use in our Kongs, you know, for our dog. So right. you do have to be careful because right. some of those sweeteners are bad for dogs. Right. But even worse, I was worried that she ate the plastic container. And I thought, oh, boy, you know what oh, that the means, flip. the big S word. Surgery, of which Dr. Alice, the dermatologist, wants nothing to do. <laughs> so having said that, our special guest today is a board-certified veterinary surgeon, Dr. Sheldon Paget. He is a true Buckeye, undergrad, and vet school at The Ohio State University. Did a year at Animal Medical Center out by you, Janet, New York City. Oh. And then, yeah, then did his residency at Washington State University College of Veterinary Medicine. Had that Buckeye gene in him, drew him okay. back to Ohio, and established the um, surgical practice at my favorite specialty hospital, Metropolitan Veterinary Specialist yep. at uh, in in Ohio. I owe Dr. Paget, Dr. Day, and Dr. Collins so much gratitude because they have given me so many years extra for all of my pets. And um, so I'm happy he could join us today. Hey, Dr. Paget. Hey. Thanks for having me, guys. This is really fun. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Well, you may not say that after it. After <laughs> we'll see. We'll you know see. what our husband, can keep talking yeah, about our husband guys, say fine. when the two of us are together? <laughs> We're a lot to take on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they get to be quiet. Then. Yeah. Just and then when I take him to an Ohio yeah. State game, it's mm-hmm. like shocking. You know, you should have put that t- that old Buckeye Tierra on today because Sheldon was on. I didn't think of that. Do you know what else now. I have? Wait a minute. I have what? my little, the Buckeye little Buckeye guys. Thing. See how cute I they like are? It. I don't have any of my Buckeye stuff right here. It's all at work. Well, I also have a tree, See? but it's a little much to show right now. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. So, Janet, mm-hmm. do you know what bloat is? You should, because you own a golden retriever. Bloat? See, you don't. Blo- B-L-O-A-T. Well, isn't that when their stomach's distended? Oh, and much more. Oh. Sheldon, tell her about Does bloat, it stand for something? Yeah. That's going to make me nuts. <laughs> So bloat is, bloat is a really common thing. And, and you're right, Janet, like the bloat that we think about with the stomach being descended, like if you come home and your dog got into 15 pounds of dog food, they've got like food bloat, right? They ate until they couldn't eat anymore. They're engorged and all that kind of stuff. But there's a different kind of bloat that we call GDV, which stands for gastric dilatation and volvulus, which is the medical term for when the stomach gets big and then it flips on itself. And I tell you, this is probably the most common middle of the night emergency that we do. Uh, And it happens to all kinds of dogs, mostly ones that have big chests. And so we see it in like big dogs, like Great Danes are the classic one. But we also see it in like labs and Rottweilers and pit bulls and even basset hounds. I mean, those are big dogs with short legs, right? 
Um, and it's a, it's a big, big deal. It's very life threatening. That's for sure. Now, so it's more common in larger chested dogs and how do you know it's happened because you see your dog is severely distended? Are they having an other? Yeah, that's the funny thing. Like a lot of them with a, such a big chest and little waist, you can't even see the stomach because it's kind of tucked up in, in there. And so what happens, this classic thing is your dog will start trying to vomit. We call it retching, and they're not bringing anything up. Well, the reason they're not bringing anything up is because their stomach's twisted. You, 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 you can't, there's no connection between the stomach and the esophagus to get something out. So they're doing this like non productive retching, and this happens quickly. I mean, they can be normal at dinner time, go for a walk, take a nap, and at nine o'clock, all of a sudden, boom, it's like that. So, what and it's really tough. And it's, what causes it though? It just happens. Yes, it's a really good question. I mean, there's lots of studies on, hey, why does this happen? And certainly we know anatomy and conformation, meaning like what size is the animal is probably the most common thing. Uh, but there's all kinds of factors. Like um, some people talk about exercise after eating, you know, the whole thing that we're just not supposed to swim after we eat. If they exercise after they eat because, you know, maybe their stomach is swinging around and then flips on itself, you know, type thing. Yeah. Um, but some of the studies actually show that things like stress, um, you know, as Alice said, I used to practice in New York City, and we had a lot more of this disease in New York City, probably because oh. those animals are a little bit more stressed, you know. Yeah. Oh. Um, and then I moved to the state of Washington, where everything's pretty yeah. chill out there. Uh, and we saw it less, we still certainly see it. But even little things like if there's, you know, a death of another animal in the family or a divorce going on in the house or something like that. And, you know, you question these clients that bring in their animals with this disease and they're, they're, there's usually something stressful in it. Um, and this happens to young animals, to old animals. It can be oh. eight months old, nine months old, 10 months old, something like that. But it goes all the way until... Uh, until they're older as well. And it, and it's very difficult to predict, that's for sure. Well, our niece yeah. has, had rescued a Great Dane, the first Great Dane, mm -hmm. and they had to right. feed her like a little bit and then have her rest and then feed her a little bit and have rest. Because I remember it was about the stomach flip. That's exactly what it is. And mm -hmm. like some people say, if you elevate their food, maybe to their elbow height, so get one of those stands yeah. or something like that. Small meals, uh, like you said, mm. um, may, and then don't let them exercise afterward. But that's you know if no, I think New York City pets also get a lot of exercise because if you think about it, people in apartments don't have yards, so you've got to take that dog out. Like Alice, like you take yours out how many times on leashes down in Florida? Mm -hmm. So they're taking them out all the yeah, time, I, right? You're not just. Opening. I had a hound dog there. You know, you're up at six a.m. walking the dog down to the bagel mm -hmm. store to get some fresh bagels and whatnot. But they're not out in the backyard mm -hmm. running around and all that kind of stuff. You know, right? So, they're always tethered. So then, so then, Sheldon, does that show up on an X-ray, or you just know by the symptoms that you got to cut up? Yeah, that's a really good question because you never know for sure what's causing this retching that they're doing, right? Yeah. And so mm -hmm. you do an x-ray and there's a really classic sign that we see on that x-ray. Mm -hmm. And and these animals usually are in shock. I mean, they're sick, you know, their mm -hmm. heart rate's really high mm -hmm. uh, and whatnot. And they're, mm -hmm. they're very sick. And, and as I said, that's usually really quickly. And that's why this is the most common middle of the night thing, because it's a true emergency. If, if we don't get that animal fixed, then their stomach is gonna continue to expand. And we have all kinds of problems that causes Lots of shock. It causes death of the stomach. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, most of the patients that have it going on for more than maybe 12 to 24 hours, they're not going to make it. So how do you, as a physician, tell the difference between like a blockage, like they ate a sock, which is, you know, common with especially Labradors, or it's the twisted stomach? How do you know? Because both that's a, of them, That's they're... a really good question. And it's, yeah, it's all, it's all about um, what the x-rays look like, right? And there's a very classic sign what the shape of the stomach and how it twists on itself that we see. Um, and so you see this, we call it a double bubble, but, you know, this where the stomach is twisting on wow. itself. As opposed to a sock where you're going to see the sock uh, or you're going to see mm -hmm. gas that's accumulating around the sock because nothing can, can go through or something like that. So oh. it, it's very different. And, 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 you know, I'm always amazed. You think medicine is black and white and you know you think it's going to be you know it's this or that and sometimes it's it's a tough call bloat we can usually tell right but that stock ah. that sock is it causing a problem mm. yeah you ate it but is it causing a problem okay. and sometimes that's a, a little bit more of a judgment call let's put it that because i know my friend has a lab that ate a sock ate a tampon and the vet over the phone said induced vomiting 
you know, with the um, mm -hmm. hydrogen peroxide. Sure. So they must have had other mm -hmm. known from other signs that yeah. it was the blind. And usually if they're vomiting because of that, they're bringing something up. Yeah. There's nothing else just mm -hmm. like bile or something like that. Yeah. With bloat, they truly can't bring anything up because of the stomach right. twist. Wow. And so that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. Janet, the stomach's twisted, so there's nothing, up. you know, to bring mm -hmm. It's almost so like you Sheldon, take a towel, a towel and squeeze it out. That's what the esophagus looks like. So nothing's getting through. So Sheldon, tell tell Janet when you do the surgery, you you have to tack it, right? Yeah. So oh. what we do is we go into the abdomen and put the stomach in the right spot, right? And you know this is unfortunate because these animals, just as I said, are shocky and they're not mm -hmm. the best anesthetic candidates. So we work really hard to get them to be as stable as they can be for mm -hmm. anesthesia over maybe a half an hour, 45 minutes, wow. something like that, and then get them to surgery. And so when we're in there, we do the, we derotate the stomach or put it in its normal position. But once they are prone to doing that, they're gonna do it again, most likely. And so we do something when we're in there to keep them from doing it again. And you're basically attaching a portion of the stomach to the chest wall or the body mm -hmm. wall so that it can't flip on itself. It's always gonna be stuck in, in the right spot. Um, and that keeps it from happening, and, and that way you never have to worry about it happening again. Okay, dumb, dumb, good. layman question. Aren't you then putting, like, a hole in the stomach to attach it? Isn't that... It's only it's only a partial thickness, and okay. so there's lots of layers of the stomach, and so we're just making an incision on the outside wow. of the stomach, which means we can't see inside. Yeah. And it's the same thing with the, the body wall. We're only wow. making a small incision on the inside. And so it very straightforward from a surgery standpoint. And it's great because those are going to heal together yeah. and you never have to worry about it again. Now they can still, their stomach can get big. They can still eat that 20 pounds of food, <laughs> but it's not going to flip on itself, which is good. Wow. Do, do a lot of people say when they have a female Great Dane and they're having her spade, do they have you tack her just preventatively? That's a really or good question. It... That, so these preventive stomach tacks, uh, medical term prophylactic gastropexy, is something that's really, okay. really common in our hospital. Um, you know, you have this 14-month-old Great Dane that, mm -hmm. whether it's a boy or a girl, you know, that's mm -hmm. going to be under anesthesia. You know they're really predisposed to mm -hmm. um, right. doing this. And so... Why not just while you're in the abdomen or while they're under anesthesia, go in there and do exactly that. And so that's something that is worth a lot of peace of mind for our mm -hmm. clients, you know. And so, I mean, I adopted a golden most recently. And when I did so and I was doing surgery, I tacked his stomach because I don't want to have to worry about it, you know. And, mm -hmm. and so that's a really, really common thing it, from you know, kind of medium-sized dogs up, almost like pit bulls mm -hmm. on up. We we will commonly do that. <laughs> or, Janet, as you said, if we're going in there for a sock, yeah. hey, your Labrador <laughs> ate a sock. We need to go in there and get it out. Do you want us to yeah. do this other thing? And I always feel like I'm trying to upsell them, but I'm not. No. I just don't want to come in in the middle of the night when I'm doing right, this, right, right. When, I'm, when they have a GDV or a, a bloat, right? And so it's a really nice thing to do. It adds a little bit of expense. It's a pretty low complication surgery. There's not a whole lot, you know, as long as you're doing it with somebody that um, has done a lot of them and, 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 mm -hmm. and whatnot. And so that's a really good thing. Well, and once and then, one surgery, putting them out once is better than twice, right? Yeah, exactly. And especially, I mean, a life-threatening, you know, <laughs> the classic number for bloat that we talk about for survival is 70%, meaning we lose 30% of those guys Ooh, to the wow. disease. Now, wow. we're doing a study right now looking at a couple of things and blood work associated with those and our survival rates much better than that. I think we've gotten better over time uh, with managing these guys, but it's still 10 to 20% we lose them because they're so sick and in such shock when we get in there. And sometimes their stomach tissue is dead and, and whatnot. It's, it's a really wow. sad thing. So you don't want to have to go through it if you don't want to, that's for sure. Hmm. You know, Janet, mm -hmm. um, we were talking, you mentioned about socks and stuff, and I have a question for Dr. Padgett. Is women's underwear the most common <laughs> foreign body that you're pulling out of the intestine? Yeah, what is? Because uh, I list... remember in school, it was a lot. <laughs> the list is long and varied of the things <laughs> that I've taken out of a dog's abdomen. And some of them are pretty embarrassing to say out loud. But um, <laughs> I would say it's probably sock. Because a lot of women's underwear, wow. depending on hold that person was, is kind of tiny these days, right? If you want to say that. Uh, and yeah. so it doesn't cause an obstruction. Um, it goes through. Yeah. Hey, yeah, it yay through. for thongs, huh? Just go through. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> it saved us so much emergency surgery. Uh, but <laughs> towels, like kitchen towels and socks by far and away. You mentioned tampons. Yeah. Those are pretty common. 
um, any food wrappers like plastic and stuff like that, like Alice was talking about with the gum and all that. Um, and, and that's a, that's a thing. Cause sometimes you just, you know, they'll go through on their own, but sometimes they get yeah. stuck. And then you have the same thing. You have this like area that's being expanded by the, yeah. by the sock or the towel, or even mm -hmm. worse, it kind of strings out and there's a little string that, <laughs> that connects two areas oh. and it's kind of sawn back and forth and we cause all kinds oh of my things. Gosh. And so that's, oh. that's one of those things where if you know, you, you know, they ate a sock, it's nice to mm -hmm. like, like somebody said, induce vomiting, yeah. you know? Um, mm -hmm. and so that's, that's a, a good thing. Check with your vet first, make sure it's an appropriate thing, depending on what they ate yeah. and how long it's been and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But, um, yeah, mm -hmm. unfortunately we take a lot of those up. What about corn cups? I remember a dachshund oh my um, having a corn cup in him for like two months or you something. Mean like whole? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they'll take like a section of it. And if you think about the diameter of corn cobs, I mean, it's just the right size yeah. to, it's like a cork. Oh my right? gosh. And so, and, and Alice, you're right. I've taken out corn cobs in the middle of February where the family says, I swear, we haven't had corn since September, you know? <laughs> right? uh, but you know <laughs> what? Right. Kind of banger. I know. You can, it can bang around the stomach and just be in the stomach for months. Mm -hmm. And then finally, if it gets into the intestine, it's a cork. Um, and and so, there's still poop, right? They're still making poop. Oh, well, not once it's obstructing the intestine, but if it's in the stomach, yeah, the stomach's just like a mixing They're chamber, right? So poop. the stomach's, stomach, stomach's just, it, everything else is getting out of the stomach except the corn cob. And I tell you, wow. uh, the amount of money that I've made on corn cobs, <laughs> you know, I mean... <laughs> That's crazy. He kept all <laughs> should those be like corn handing cups. out corn at our He kept them all. Okay. They're like little trophies. <laughs> hey, Janet, yeah. should we tell him the story about daddy at the gastroenterologist and what mother yeah, said? Yeah, you go ahead. We've told the story uh -oh. before, but they may have cut it. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and this, you know, the sad thing is my, my parents have both passed away, but my dad had um, cancer of the appendix that then went to the intestine. So he, he wasn't pooping. I mean, I guess probably just mucus was coming out or something. So... That we, I took him to the gastroenterologist at the hospital where I was working and my mother was kind of crazy. And so she came. And so the Dr. Kazmierski comes in the room and my mother just blurts out to him, where is all that BM going? <laughs> and Alice goes, and I went, I've got to work with these people. So anyway, that's our, that's our obstruction story. But, you know, and my dad had surgery and he did fine for, 11 more years. So, but it, you know, but it was so very logical. You, were full of it, you, you know, as a layman, yeah, right. um, it was, it, you know, it was very logical what for you? her. Like if, if he's not going, where is it? You know, I know. Yeah. Where is all that being going? Right. Right. <laughs> so the other thing I wanted to, to ask Sheldon about is people that don't have their dogs spayed and neutered, particularly spayed. Mm. And that that becomes an emergency because Oh, so there's all kinds of things that we can talk about with spaying and neutering, right? Oh. I mean, we all have heard the prevent pet, pet overpopulation and everything like that, which is super important. We don't want a bunch of strays running around and okay. whatnot. But uh, dogs that are not spayed that go into heat, the hormonal influence can not uncommonly cause an infection of the uterus. That's known as pyometra, right? And so oh. you have a uterus that's um, you know, all prime for making puppies and all that kind of stuff. And if something accident, if some bacteria accidentally get up in that area, they can thrive there and create this infection. And, you know, normally uh, a dog's uterus, say maybe a, a lab's uterus is the size of this pen, you know, the diameter of this pen, and there's two horns like this. We can have dogs that their uterus is full of pus, like that much pus on oh. each side. It's really, it's really sad. And they come in sick as well. And sometimes mm -hmm. they're leaking that pus oh my God. and sometimes oh. they're not. And especially if they're not leaking that pus and it's all, you know, clamped in there and staying in there. So they're releasing all these toxins and all that kind of yeah. stuff. And that usually happens a couple of weeks after they're in heat. Uh, and so wow. we get these animals that come in that are not feeling well, maybe vomiting, maybe drinking too much water and things like that. And it's a female. And again, Janet, yeah. you can usually take an x-ray and see that big, big distended oh. uterus there. And so now we're doing an emergency surgery on a dog, which is a, basically a glorified spay. But now that dog's really sick yeah. and she's not doing well. And we have to take this dog that's not stable to surgery to help her out as well. Yeah. And so that's another 
sur emergency surgery that's really preventable, you know, if we can yeah. say, hey, we're going to do that regular thing. Um, and so it's really interesting, if you don't mind me talking about spaying, mm -hmm. because we were talking about Great Danes before, you know, I, yeah. the, the, the recommendations are really changing with spaying and neutering for especially mm -hmm. our giant breed dogs. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of our shelters just want to spay them and get yeah. before they even leave the walls, which I totally understand. That's important. Yeah. Um, but these large breed dogs, we, I, it depends on what we're worried about as to when we're going to spay them. Um, and when yeah. I say worried about always spay them for the, for the uterine infection, that's pyometra, right? And we yeah. always want to get them spayed in general, but if you get a puppy, sometimes it's better to wait a little longer. Mm -hmm. And we know that spaying them before their first heat really prevents mammary tumors, um, mammary gland tumors, which is a common thing in dogs. But even more importantly, if you spay or neuter them before their first heat in their giant breed, then that can mm -hmm. actually predispose them to certain tumors. And there's a really big golden retriever study going on right now that's looking at golden retrievers or their lifespan and what are the effects associated with it but we know that if a if let's say a great dane is neutered before before he's an adolescent mm -hmm. he has a significantly uh -huh. higher chance of getting a bone cancer which is a really common thing in great danes and a really wow. terrible disease and so if especially if you have a larger giant breed dog and definitely talk about talk to your veterinarian about when to spay that one and it's kind of mm. challenging because it like i said it depends on which hat you're wearing do i want to prevent mammary tumors or bone tumors do i want to make sure that they don't get a uterine infection and all those kind of things and so it's that's, that's really kind of up in the air you know we always said before six months was an important thing and overall mm -hmm. that's still a good recommendation but maybe not if they're a giant dog that's so interesting that's something to put out there because a couple of my friends um adopted they will lab mixes they're they're rescues and Two of the vets said, wait till, and they're females, wait till they have their first cycle and then mm -hmm. do the um, spaying, which, and I had not heard and of And that's something that's relatively new. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And it helps with some of the orthopedic diseases as well. One of the most common orthopedic diseases is cruciate rupture. And there's, I think there's some hormonal prevention there as well. Not my huh. expertise. Right. I only do soft tissues and whatnot. But in the big picture, yeah, th there's all kinds of things to consider. It's a good conversation to have. So, Sheldon, how did you decide on this specialty? On surgery? So mm -hmm. I'm lucky enough I do surgery, but then I also am even more specialized and do mostly cancer surgery, but also mm. anything inside the abdomen or no chest, you know, like we talked about with this bloat or pyometra or anything like that. And so specifically surgery, I don't know, I get to do all the fun things um, and yeah. people are gross. You know, I wouldn't want to do it on people. Um, and um, bones are great because, but they're kind of, I'm allowed to say it. There's not an orthopod in the room. Bones are boring. Like me fix bone oh. every time, you know? <laughs> and so, in my world, I get to work on livers and kidneys and yeah. this and that. And all yeah. that so I really enjoy it. Um, specifically for cancer, which is really my yeah. passion. Um, I really enjoy giving clients a path through what can be a bad time, right? And giving them not yeah. false hope, right. but different right. options and getting them through that mm -hmm. and knowing that there are options. Because a lot of times, kind of an old school thing is, oh, your dog's got cancer. You know, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, and, and that's not necessarily true anymore. And we're not talking doing things like they do on human side or they're doing right. everything short of killing you to cure you. Right. We're talking about longer life, quality life and all those kind of things. And I meet so many great people that are so thankful just to have information more than anything else, you know, and right. say, Hey, these are my options and, and, and those kind of things. And so I'm, I'm really lucky to do that. And, um, mm -hmm. I just meet some people that are really crazy about their animals and really nice people and just want to help mm -hmm. out their family member. Right. Well, was there, I'm curious, was there any of our teachers at Ohio State that influenced you the most? Oh, uh, so yeah, Alice, you and I can go down memory lane on all that kind of stuff, but I know, honestly, and I love every one of them. To, yeah. to, to mention specifically, Mary McLaughlin was a soft tissue surgeon oh, at Ohio State University. Um, and I was fortunate enough to work with her when I was an undergrad and vet school mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. And she probably got me my residency for all I know. Um, and, but she was just fantastic. And she had away with people, right? She mm -hmm. was really good at connecting with clients and, and yeah. really good at, and that showed me, hey, you can do this and, and really affect them, not just the animals, because we're all, you know, we all become veterinarians because we love the animals and we want to help them, but really to help that other person that you have to deal with. It's almost like being a pediatrician, right? Yeah. Your, your patient's over oh. there, but can't talk to you. That's the boss yeah. over there, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so, 
Yeah, Mary, uh, Mary helped me a lot, and I'm very thankful for her every time I see her. And her right. Gordon Setters. Oh, I love her, her Gordon, Gordon Setters. You can't see a Gordon Setter and not think of Mary McLaughlin. Hey, did you know that for dogs and cats that could benefit from a prescription diet, Blue Buffalo offers natural veterinary diets formulated by animal nutritionists and veterinarians for certain dietary needs like kidney support, weight management, gastrointestinal support, and my particular favorite, dermatology. They make a food allergic diet that's an alligator based called NP or a hydrolyzed salmon base for dogs and cats called HF. Contact your veterinarian about these prescription blue buffalo diets. You know, That's Janet, um, Sheldon, when Sheldon did surgery on cinnamon, when she was eight, she had that intestinal adenocarcinoma and bought her six and a half more years. Yeah. So it just goes yeah. to show you cancer is not deadly right. if you catch. And having said that, you've got to be an observant owner, too, though. Yeah, you know, exactly. dogs. And cats, right. They're creatures of habit. And when I saw that she was. It, the stool just wasn't right. Yeah. And I'm, you know me, I'm on the phone right then. But yeah, it was cancer at eight. But look at six and a half more. He doubled her life almost. She lived a long yeah. life. And I always tell my clients, like I would tell my residents, mom knows best. When <laughs> when you guys come in and say, hey, there's something wrong. There's something mm -hmm. wrong. I guarantee it. Because you're right. They're creatures of habit. Nobody knows them better than you. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I totally get that. I'm very, very true. Well, I have actually you a, know, funny, I, a funny Libby story. She's a gold and a rescue. Okay. And he doesn't know about Libby. Oh, well, I don't want to tell the whole Libby. story. But anyway, so Libby, I had made this bourbon bacon popcorn for a party we had and put it in really cute cups. It's really oh, good. It's from a restaurant wonderful. in um, somewhere out west. But anyway, I made it. And so it has bacon in it, right? And it smells really good. Mm -hmm. And she is under the radiator in the kitchen, like this way, that way, <laughs> trying to get in there. And it's only like this big of a space. And I get down on my hands and knees. And then she's all excited because I'm at her level, you know, sniffing me, sniffing me. <laughs> and I'm looking. I see nothing. I can't see anything. So then my husband, Donald, comes home. And I go, you know, she keeps going at that spot. He gets, you know, the iPhone camera out. And he's under there. And he goes, look. And it was literally like teeny weeny sliver of oh. bacon. But she could smell that bacon, 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 right? It was hysterical. That was yeah. last night. And we're like. <laughs> That little bit. Just last night? That's funny. Yeah. We didn't give it to her because well, it was kind of dog hair all over. Janet adopted Libby from Sandy. It, this was an Amish, well, it was a young dog. It was six months yeah. old. And it somehow got away from the Amish, got hit by a car, oh, found a field. And I think Mark, Dr. Mm -hmm. Day worked on her. Mm -hmm. Didn't she, she have an FHO, Janet? What is that? Broke, yeah, had, take, take the ball off. They cut off that of thing off. They yeah. cut this off mm -hmm. of the femur. I think Mark did that. Yeah. And she's great. Yeah. We have a big so, hill that we live up on and she runs up and down yeah. that hill and we always go, what hip? What hip? Every time. You yeah. never know, right? <laughs> Before they had total hips and kids, they did that to kids too. Yeah. Um, when they had Is that right? Mm -hmm. Back in the, well, before me, let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I've had two dogs, one German Shepherd I found hit and left for dead on Route 18. Mm. And then another dog that Dr. Dehoff, uh, no, I'm sorry, that was a cat that was hit. Uh, and then another dog, in, when I was practicing in Warren, Ohio, was hit and left for dead. And they both had FHOs. And I remember Dr. Mann from Metro did the FHO on Katie the Shepherd. And he said to me, you know, this is kind of new. I don't wow. know. We don't know if it's going to be great for big dogs. And Katie did great. What is FHO? Oh, yeah. you Femur? Femoral head ostectomy. Okay. Ostectomy means take to take the bone out. out. The femoral head is the ball, the ball and socket. Huh. Yep. And you were going to say something, Sheldon. Oh, yeah, Sheldon. I I've, I've, I've got a question for you. Sure. I, you know, do you ever watch um, the the not Doctor Pole, the vet show um, where he's out in Colorado? Uh, Doctor Jeff, Rocky Mountain mm -hmm. Vet. I, 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 I'm ashamed to admit that I don't. It's like watch and work okay. for me, so I don't well, typically. He, he does a lot of surgeries. Sure. And, okay. and I remember this shepherd that came in, and it was a hemangiosarcoma, which we'll talk about in a minute. But he made the comment to this lady, and she was a dog person, okay, the owner, that, you know, sometimes we do these surgeries, and they look great, and then three days later we lose oh. them. And what's your thought on that? I had never heard that. So, you know, I, I think it depends on – how we manage those cases afterward. Um, mm -hmm. You know, 
there, I'm lucky that I work at a very large hospital. Mm -hmm. You know, we have hundreds of employees and lots and lots and lots of doctors. And so we can care for these animals in a way that maybe we can't in, just, in your regular veterinarian's world, let's put it that way. Right. Um, and right. so that's why we're here. Yeah. You know, if you, some, you don't feel comfortable with something, you're, if your regular veterinarian doesn't feel comfortable with something, they send it to us, right? And mm -hmm. so, yeah, we're watching those dogs really closely. Dogs with that type of disease specifically um, can, can be susceptible to heart arrhythmias or their heart beating abnormally to the right. point that it can be fatal, right? Mm -hmm. And okay. so we're watching those guys on a 24 hour EKG, it's up on a screen in the intensive care unit, wow. everybody's mm -hmm. watching it. And if they're showing signs that their heart isn't beating normally, then we put them on medications and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't take our risk down to zero, but it really significantly decreases it. So Alice, I don't know for sure, but I'm guessing yeah, that's right, what right. we're talking about there is some kind of arrhythmia that can get worse hmm. two to three days after surgery okay. um, and uh, they, they can be fatal. And so, uh, yeah, one of the reasons that we watch them so closely is exactly that. Yeah. Is hemangiosarcoma the number one tumor you take out? No, fortunately, because it's a bad player, right? Yeah. Hemangiosarcoma is a, is a tumor of blood vessels, mm -hmm. and it's really common in dogs, and there are specific areas that it's common in. It can happen anywhere there are blood vessels, to be honest with you, but it's common in the spleen. We can see mm -hmm. it in the liver, and it even happens in the heart, but it can happen mm -hmm. other places. And it's a really bad player, mostly because not only does it spread to other parts of the body really readily, but also because it's made, it's a tumor made of abnormal blood vessel tissue, it's really fragile and it can rupture. Oh. And so mm -hmm. we get these animals in again on emergency, they're absolutely fine one minute. And then an hour later, wow. their tumor is ruptured. Nobody knew they had a tumor because yeah. it doesn't yeah. hurt them. It doesn't cause a problem. It doesn't cause cancer like you and I think of. They're not losing weight hmm. and all that kind of stuff. And all of a sudden they're just tumor ruptures and they look fine on the outside, except they're in shock. And so wow. they have a belly full of blood because they're bleeding their bleeding out of their ruptured splenic tumor. And oh. so we don't like hemangiosarcoma because it's a bad player. Not only is it aggressive, but also causes very acute problems. And so there comes a point, those of us who are in the business and I know Alice, you probably do this exact same thing. Like I've got an eight year old dog. Now I'm going to do my senior wellness. And even that senior wellness, you know, a lot of times when people come into the vet, they think, ah, we're just trying to, you know, do this and do that and do that, you know? Well, if you do an ultrasound, you catch that tumor when it's really small, not when it's really big, you know, and whatnot. And so there comes a point where we all have senior dogs. We're just doing an ultrasound and blood work and chest x-rays every six months because something's gonna happen. It's like you and me, something's gonna happen eventually. Let's find it early so we can treat it and give them a better quality of life later, hmm. you know? They just told me because I'm so turning, what? wait, because I'm turning 65, I have to get another pneumonia vaccine. And I'm like, it's like a magic okay. I just I I just got my shingles. Oh, yeah, I did I that one. Yeah. Did you shingles? Yeah. I felt like hell. I did both of them and it was awful. My husband didn't do yeah, the but second Jan, one because he felt so sick. Your husband never got the second one. He's got to go in and get He won't do it. I'm telling yeah. you. He felt so awful. And his internist, he comes home. It was December 23rd. And he goes, so I got the pneumonia vaccine and I got the shingles. I said, that, I, like, are you nuts? Because it was before Christmas. <laughs> and he had the worst Christmas before. ever. He goes, I'm not going back. That's I it. tell you. Yeah, I, I, I've had shingles and I'd much rather feel like crap for two days after having the vaccine than get shingles, to tell you the truth. That's why I get it. He had oh, shingles yeah. too, and that's why he hey, got it. Sheldon, I have a question that somebody, one of the listeners submitted. Um, I had read that certain lawn chemicals like 2,4-D uh -huh. and of course cigarette smoke can enhance bladder, the development of bladder cancer cigarette in smoke? certain breeds. Cigarette what? smoke? Cigarette like smoke. Like secondhand smoke. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, what, so what comment on that? Yeah. And so I do deal with a lot of cancer. I'm not an oncologist, so I don't probably know the most yeah. recent studies, but it's very true. There are certain tumors that are, shall we say, socioeconomic tumors. We see a much higher mm -hmm. incidence in nice suburbs that have lawn treatments and everybody grass is green and doesn't have weeds and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and that, those are bladder tumors, as you said, Alice, also lymphoma. Mm -hmm um is is much more common with that and certain oral cancers because they get it on yeah. their feet and they lick their feet right um and so yeah it is true and so it's it's a hmm. it's a plug you know my lawn 
probably wasn't the biggest, the nicest lawn, went, but I had natural type stuff because I don't want my dog to get cancer because of those chemicals that are on it, you know. That's what we do. Same here. We do. And actually, we get treated and you know, for ticks and we use, it's an um, cedar oil. I actually had our guy, Matt, send me the picture of the label because I wanted to know what was in it and I hmm. researched it and we get it more frequently, you know, like nine times a year, mm-hmm. but um, we, it's a cedar oil and I'm, I'm really happy with it. And it actually kind of smells good. That's really interesting. Mm-hmm. Sheldon, do you have a dog now? Yeah. Where's your dog? Uh, so uh, Alice and I were talking about this. I had an unfortunate house fire. My dog's fine, um, but doesn't live with me because I'm in temporary housing right now. Oh. Um, so it lives with my sister up in Michigan. I mean, no, you that said other state it. Up north. <laughs> <laughs> the M word. Muck- Buckeyes don't say Michigan. that. You're right. And for those who don't know, Buckeyes don't say that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but she's up in Detroit and he's up there and he's great. So we have a and question for oh, you, Dr. Padgett. What is okay, what that? is your pet what? peeve? And that can be a pet or human peeve. And actually, Alice, yeah, I we had, a, we have, we have, we had a, a listener write in one, and I'll tell you that in a minute, in a second. That's interesting. Um, I don't I don't have any pet pet peeves because, I mean, <laughs> animals are perfect, right. right? They're perfect as they are. Right. It doesn't matter. So it's got to be a human pet peeve. <laughs> and if we're talking about animal-associated ones, um, oh, I don't know. Boy, some come to mind, and I'm not allowed to say them. Uh, <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna say... Um, not a, not exploring, not taking um, ownership of having a pet. Yeah. You know, not not everybody can do what I can yeah. do what I offer. Right? I right. unfortunately offer what could be a luxury service. I mean, a lot of these things are pretty expensive and whatnot. But at least you should know what's going on. And there are so many yes. clients that I meet that they say, "I wish I would have known you for my last for my last oh, pet yes. because I didn't know this was even an option." Mm-hmm. And and that's us. That's on us trying to communicate the veterinary population in general, let alone the clients, you know, because yeah. because, you know, that other boss that I have is a, your veterinarian that sends their cases to me. And and I want to make sure they know there are some options. And believe you me, I don't need the business. I wish there was less cancer, but at right. least know that there know that there are other options, you yeah. know, which is really important. You know, I have to agree with that, because if I counted every time someone said to me, I wish I would have come to you sooner. Mm. Yeah. And and so and part of this podcast is we're highlighting specialists to, so that people know yep. there are specialists in in certain fields ophthalmology surgery dermatology internal medicine cancer um, I'll meet people occasionally that say well what do you do well I'm a veterinary dermatologist and there's a big pause yeah, yeah. and then, then the comment is there enough calling for that. And, oh, I'll say, <laughs> and I'll say, if your dog was itchy, you'd have me on speed dial at two in the morning. Well, it's you know funny because when I tell people that my sister is a doctor of veterinary medicine, a specialist in allergy and dermatology, they go, they do that? Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. And I tell you, I wish we grew more dermatologists yeah. because there aren't enough of them. That's mm-hmm. for sure. No, um, I know. It's, it's, a really, it's a really popular thing and it's really in demand. It's really... I, you know, I may save animals, but Alice keeps them comfortable, Yeah, you know, and, and, and both, both clients and, and the pets, it's a really, really important cause. Hmm. Wow. So wait, we well, have one shall... thing that I wanted to mention when we're going circling all the way back to bloat. And I just, this <laughs> yeah. is, no, all, yeah. it, bloat is like this. Me... Bloat is like this. Not yeah, like bloat this. Bloat is the twist. This is yeah. bloat. <laughs> yeah. It's the, it's the twist. When the flo- stomach international on symbol and, oh, and because now I do. and and I had kind of forgotten about it right up until we talked about I wish more people knew about it and so right. a lot of animals come to me when they're healthy you know I do mostly cancer work I work on some birth defects and in the middle I work on these animals that are healthy and they're coming to me for a prophylactic procedure meaning one that's going to prevent and so we talked about when we do a bloat surgery mm-hmm. when an animal has bloat we're in there and we do a procedure to keep that from, from happening again that's called a stomach tack and in these predisposed animals like alice said before you can do a prophylactic mm-hmm. one meaning hey my animal's healthy i just don't want this ever to happen again and the nice thing is is that 
you know, in our hospital, we can do that all through laparoscopic surgery. Oh, and cool. so instead of a long incision that's, you know, this long when we're doing a spay and things like that, we do it through three one centimeter incisions. And we can do the spay through that. We can do the, wow. the gastropexy through that and everything like that. And it's really nice. And it, a lot of people do it. We, it's, it requires some really fancy toys, mm -hmm. you know, human stuff right. that's disposable and all that. So it's more expensive. But a lot of people really find that that helps them make that decision because man, I don't want an incision mm -hmm. this big on my dog, you know, and all that kind of right. stuff. And so they, it's been shown that they're less painful, that they recover better, that everything goes well. They still have to be exercise restricted because you got to have everything on the inside heal, but it, it is really nice. And so that's available for a lot of things. Probably a stomach tack is the most common thing I do, but I'm, tomorrow I'm taking a gallbladder out that way and all kinds of stuff. And so that, you know, obviously that's common in human medicine. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is it's, more comfortable yeah. and that's why we do it and so those are the kind of things that you know that's just my specialty there's all kinds of other specialties that have really interesting things that people don't know about that are good options for them that's well and also as a pet owner you don't want to come home yeah. with that big incision because it's a pain in the neck the cone the thing you know right but having said that janet when when dr paget has to take off like sarcomas sure. or mast cell tumors you know and the tumor is like this big and the suture comes out like that you have, have to, to get what we call wide margins, mm -hmm. right, children? Mm -hmm. Oh, to go in and yeah, dig exactly. around. Yeah. And yeah. So cancer, yeah. yeah and, and, you know, if these malignant tumors have what roots or tentacles or whatever you want to talk about. Mm -hmm. And that depending on which tumor that is, it can be pretty far. So we're, for, yeah. Yeah, like she said, for a tumor this big, we're taking out a piece of tissue this yeah. big. And people are surprised when they come in with a tumor this big that I say, yeah. you know, this isn't this isn't feasible for surgery because then we'd have to take out oh that gosh. much, you know? Right. And, and so, so that's one of those things where Alice, you said, if I had a dollar for every time somebody said, I wish I'd known about you sooner, you know, mm -hmm. these, these poor, I shouldn't say poor animals, but just yeah. these clients that don't have the, the right information, they, you know, they wait and watch this tumor grow for a year. And then, we're, then we have limited options. So, Early intervention, early intervention, early intervention. That's a really, really so, and cytology, cytology, cytology. If the, yep, any 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 animal that came to me with a lump or bump, and my technician used to laugh because people would call and say, "Hey, so and so's got a bump on," and my technician used to say, "Hold it up to the phone so we can see it." You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, but now you can see it. Okay, that's but true. Back then, you got to come in. You cannot tell by looking. You cannot yeah. tell by feeling. And don't tell me that's movable. That means nothing to me. A needle has to go in there, suck some cells out. Give me five minutes. If I can't identify it, I'll send it to the lab and I'll tell you tomorrow. Mm. And yep. it's got to be done. I can't preach that enough. Cytology. I'm with you, Alice. Fine needle aspirate. Yes, because then... Then they go to Sheldon when it's a softball size and he can't cut that out. There's no. nowhere to close yeah. after. Or it's much, much more challenging. I'm doing another surgery tomorrow that we have to do skin flaps and all that kind of stuff just because oh my it's gosh. a bigger tumor. Wow. Um, and so, you know, it's a lot easier to address when it's, when it's much smaller. And, and I'm with you, Alice. My, mine is, my, my saying is always, my eyes aren't microscopes. We got to figure it out. We got to, <laughs> we got to, you can't tell until you get some more information. This has been so, now. so informative. I mean, I, I learned a lot as Good. just an average, you know, pet <laughs> owner. Um, we, we really appreciate your time and your um, smarts, as daddy would say, Alice. <laughs> He's a smart cookie. <laughs> this is why we have Janet on because this would have turned into OSU. Yeah, just, no. And I talking words. about, I talking about old long professors. words that mean nothing to a layman. <laughs> mean nothing. I know. Start we all the I know, words. and I'm yeah. thinking so kind of We love you, and we want to have you back. So please make yourself available. When answer my text when I text you. Okay, but yeah, wait, exactly. Alice. We did have. I sent what? our promo to one of my friends, and she said, "I have a pet peeve." And I said, well, you okay. know, tell me what it is. And she said, I have a friend whose dog's name is Peeve and introduces the dog as, this is my pet Peeve. And she said, it makes me <laughs> crazy. <laughs> yeah. This is my pet Peeve. Yeah. yeah. Like, Peeve, oh, Peeve, 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 right? Yeah. So I thought that was hysterical. That's like cute. <laughs> okay. I doesn't think so. Well, I guess we're going to close it out. Listen, thanks everyone for tuning in. Janet, mm -hmm. you have a great day. Sheldon, thanks a million. Oh, Hope your place gets built back soon. I owe. Oh, eight. Bye.
Hey, thanks for tuning in today. We hope you found the science-based information provided helpful in taking care of your pet. Check out our other Speaking of Pets episodes wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love to hear from you. So email your pet photos and or pet peeves to contact at speakingofpetspod.com. Remember to follow Speaking of Pets on all social media.